two-way street where you might think um, as someone who's learning from someone else, you're, you know, you're soaking it all up, you're getting all this free advice. But the flip side is that that mentor is also learning from you and learning valuable things that they will be able to apply to their job, um, whether it's insight about how someone who's more junior in their career is approaching things, or it might even you know, veer into tools, like you know, different tools that they're using for productivity or whatever that might be, and so, or hip new language. Um, so it, mentoring is really a two-way street, and I wish I had gotten that piece of advice earlier in my career. I think that's really interesting, and I want to um, actually do a quick follow-up on that. Do you have any advice around how people should go and get mentors? Should they be proactive and seek them out? I mean, I, that certainly seems like a valid strategy. Do sometimes the mentors pick you? And then, you know, sometimes are the lines blurred? Is it sort of like you have a friend who is really capable or has strengths maybe that you don't have with additional insights, and is that person technically a mentor? Or what, how do you, what advice would your be? What, what yeah. advice would you give to other people seeking uh, mentors? Yeah. So. First of all, don't get too hung up in finding a mentor. Like, you know, ooh, I need my mentor who's going to show me everything. That's not necessary. Mr. Miyagi. What's that, Pornima? That's a Mr. Miyagi. Yeah, <laughs> don't, 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 don't worry about getting Mr. Miyagi. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and instead, think of micro mentoring. Like, anytime you feel that I need to learn something or I need advice about something, and who in my network do I have who I could reach out to? Or who do I respect that I want to? approach to say, can we just have coffee? Can I, you know, can I get 30 minutes of your time on the phone? Whatever that might look like. Um, and not have it be a big thing. Just be, have it be really clear. Like, I want to learn the specific thing from you or get your advice on a specific thing and do that. And then see if that turns into a bigger relationship, uh, you know, more of an ongoing kind of thing. Um, but just just dive in and yes, you, you should be proactive and you should be looking out for this. Um, and it's so cool to have it be someone that you just respect who you know. It could be a friend, a peer. It could be someone younger than you, someone older than you. It doesn't matter. Great, absolutely. Um, before we take a few more questions from, um, and, and I'm sorry, Pornima, did you want to add anything there? Oh, uh, I actually, so I like to, I like to do a two-way mentorship where I think it's also really, um, like the way that I stay relevant or like keep up I feel like now I'm a little bit older, but like keep up with the kids is to mentor them, but also learn from them because a lot of times they have ways of using technology or learning uh, that you might not even have thought of, right? Because at some point you kind of get stuck in your ways. So I often like to look to people who are still in college or have just graduated. And even though I might be mentoring them on the bigger things like how to ask for a 10K raise or you know how to get a promotion, they're a lot of times mentoring me in what they're doing and how they're, how they're doing things. So I think that's really valuable. And then the second thing I was going to say is I've always had trouble getting like the really high profile people to mentor me. Um, I, I don't know. I, I know there are people that have have them. Um, I don't. And, and so what I ended up doing is just finding people who were like big brothers or big sisters. Like who do I know is maybe not like in terms of years, but in terms of experience, uh, three to five years ahead of me, like who's already started a business, who's already written a book, or you know, who's already been through one of these challenges that has the time and willingness to sit down. And often those people are much more approachable and their stories are much more relevant to what I'm going through in that moment. You know, even if I sat down with somebody who was like a CEO at a for, for, uh, Fortune 500 company, I might not really be able to use a lot of that knowledge or like the tactical stuff for many, many years. But if I sat down with somebody who's, you know, been in a position that I'm starting to be in, in, in three to five years, then yeah, they probably have a lot of um, information or advice that's relevant to me. I think that's great advice. Um, before we jump into more questions from uh, the guests, um, I would like to maybe focus on briefly how you guys met and sort of what the inspiration for the book was and maybe what uh what the purpose behind Bim Jr. is and maybe how the book relates to that if uh, if at all. Do you want to go, Pornima? Um, yes. Yeah, so, sure, sure. So um so Karen and I actually met about three years ago uh, at a luncheon hosted by Andreessen Horowitz. 
so uh, thank you, A16Z. Uh, they had brought together a number of uh, technical women at this luncheon, and we just coincidentally sat next to each other and you know, did the exchange of like, oh, what do you do, what do you do? And Karen mentioned how she was um, a w an advocate for women in technology, had just left her position at Adobe, and was looking to start you know, coaching and mentoring women. And then I talked about um, Femgineer being this education company, where we're looking to help people level up in their careers and um, we do things like offer online courses. And so we um, realized that we needed to talk to each other after the, the luncheon. So we just started um, you know, brainstorming and collaborating on a number of things. And then this past year, we started teaching a course called the Confident Communicator course. Uh, a lot of it was based off of our own experiences with public speaking. You know, we've, we've both given TED Talks in the last year, and we realized that it had brought us a lot of opportunities over the course of our career, but we noticed that a lot of uh, both technical and non-technical folks who just weren't doing it. You know, a lot of it is fear-based, but a lot of it is also because they're just so heads down and they think that that's what's going to lead to the promotions, but oftentimes it's not. And so we wanted to start teaching the course. Um, we did an iteration of it and we'd been doing it as workshops and other companies and startups uh, as, and you know, the general community and then decided to really codify it into a book so that we could basically, you know, increase our reach and, and bring this to more people. Great. Um, what, uh, so for maybe for a lot of technical people out there, what do you think is um, the most compelling reason or use case for why they would need to, to be public speaking? And like, what is the value um, of being able to effectively uh, public speak? Yeah, can I take that one, Pornima? Yeah. yeah. So, so many of us in tech who are engineers, we love the craft of engineering. We love building product, whatever that might be. And we are very heads down. We do our work. We, maybe we're really good at it. We love it. We're making a difference. We're shipping code. But that's not what's going to get you ahead in your career, whatever your career goals are, whether it's to um, gain more responsibility at your company or if it's to join a different company <laughs> or get noticed by some VC um, because you want to get uh, venture funding, whatever your career goal is, you're not going to be able to achieve it as easily or as well if you're not visible. And so that visibility that comes with public speaking is critical. And we're not talking about giving TEDx talks or TED talks necessarily. We're also just talking about speaking up in meetings, um, offering to do demos at um, stand-up meetings, offering to go on customer visits and talking to customers, just being very confident about your ability to communicate in whatever the setting is that presents itself is going to lead to visibility so that people notice you, they know what you're, um, you, you have done, what your potential is, and opportunities will open up. Yeah, Great. and I would add to that, you know, one thing for, for those who are especially technical, because, um, you know, there's a lot of folks out there who really pride themselves on having deep knowledge, whether it's in design or engineering. And what I've always found is if you really want to own that, if you really want to say like, yes, I am like the PHP king or queen, then taking the time to actually teach somebody, whether it's onboarding a new employee or putting a how-to guide or explaining the best practices of your company um, is a great way to codify your understanding. And I, I've, I've um, you know, a lot of engineers that I've coached, when they start to teach, because it's a much more natural way for them to speak, um, they realize like, oh, I didn't realize there were so many gaps in my own knowledge and it's forced me to become a better learner. It's elevated my technical skills as well. And so there's this nice cycle effect that happens. So it's not about necessarily, you know, always being self-promotional. A lot of times it's developing your own skills, but but to Karen's point, yes, you do need to, to get out there and, and promote yourself. You're your own best advocate. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so it seems like it's a lot also about, you know, just effective and clear communication and, and learning and growing um, and promoting yourself in your career. I, to me, this seems really similar to some of the things that Sheryl Sandberg talked about in Lean In. Was that, uh, it, are there parallels there? Is that a source of inspiration or do you, what are your thoughts? I'd say what we've done in our book is really provide like a step-by-step -step guide. It's something that we pride ourselves on at Femgineer. Like, you know, we see a lot of these great role models out there who are writing books to inspire and get um, both men and women to like act. But what we want to do is take it one step further and provide a, here are the steps, like step one, 
how do you figure out if you even have expertise worth sharing? Like what's a project that you worked on recently that you can speak about? You know, step two is how can you form that into a topic? And so what we like to do is we try to break everything down and that way people aren't left wondering what's next. How do I do this? Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, Sheryl Sandberg did that, but I think a lot of people often read, um, read books by these great people and then are left wondering, okay, what do I do next? How do I get started? What's the next step? And so for our book, it's, you know, start with um, a topic or like, you know, figure out how to craft your topic and then how to do your proposal and, and all the way to how do you create a mini audience so that you get practice and you're not nervous. But we're basically there with you every step of the way so that you can shine on presentation day. That said, That's great. So it's very actionable. Yeah. And that said, though, Alex, um, I, I do hope and I think Pornima feels the same way. I do hope that because we are two women with technical backgrounds who are talking about public speaking and doing a lot of it our, ourselves, that we will become role models for more people who feel that they aren't welcome at tech events to be speaking, whether that's because they're women and we're minorities or for whatever other reason. We just hope that we are role models to get and encourage more people to share their expertise on stage. Great. I want to pull on a question here from uh, Jack. Um, and she asks, what is the number one piece of advice to help the regular Joe or Josephine speak better in public, uh, tech or otherwise? I think the number one piece of advice that I give people is to really um, speak as if you're speaking to like your best friend. Because people have this uh, notion that like public speaking, oh my gosh, like I have to be really elevated in my, sp in my speech and I have to present well, I have to project. And when you start to do all of those things, you get really, really worried. You are no longer present. You get, and that's a lot of times what causes you to get nervous. So um, what we advise, you know, number one piece of advice would be speak as if you're speaking to your best friend. You don't want to be that professor that puts everybody to sleep in like the freshman comp sci class, right? Um, so, so that would be mine. Karen, do you have one piece of advice? Yeah, so many people hold themselves back from speaking in public because they're nervous. And, and Pornia was just mentioning that. And I love telling people some tips for getting over stage fright. And our favorite is one that we teach in our workshops and we talk about it in the book too. And it's called power posing. And a woman named Amy Cuddy popularized this through a TED talk. And so you can um, look for that, Amy Cuddy, C-U-D-D-Y. And it's all about using positions of like posing with powerful positions, like maybe you just won a race. And so you put your hands up in a victory sign, or maybe it's because you're a bodybuilder and you wanna like, you know, uh, uh, pretend you're posing as a bodybuilder. Um, by doing power poses like this for two minutes, our body chemistry changes so that we create more testosterone, which makes us feel confident and powerful. And we lower our cortisol, which is an anxiety hormone. So this actually works. And there's science that backs it up and there's anecdotal evidence about it too. But I love telling people about power posing so that they get over that notion of, I don't even wanna do it because I'm gonna to be too scared. I'm gonna to be too nervous. Yeah, and, and oh. uh, I'm sorry, I was gonna, I was gonna ask, ask if you had anything for Nima. No, I was gonna say, uh, Amy's got a book coming out. Actually, I think it's already out. I think it's coming out today or maybe it came out earlier this week um, on, on having a presence. And so definitely talks more about the power posing. Um, and we've definitely, I know I've experienced this, like I didn't know about the power pose. Karen told me about it. And then after that, I don't give a single talk without doing the power pose before. And it's, it's remarkable um, how powerful it is because you, you think like, oh, okay, whatever. Uh, but then once you start to do it and you get into this practice, you realize how valuable it can be. And, you know, we joke around, like, use it, use it before a meeting, use it before like a really tough conversation with like a friend or a spouse or whomever. Um, and you will, you will see results. Yeah, I totally agree. I actually, I remember watching that TED talk a long time ago when I was a consultant and I, I started doing that and I found it very helpful as well. <laughs> I think that's great advice. Let's see if we can pull in another question here. Um, one from Ryan. What is your biggest regret? <laughs> biggest regret? I don't have any. And this question for the no. for the listeners is um, <laughs> no regrets. You know, I, I had the same thing, and then I, I read um, 
I read a book recently where it said like you're supposed to have some regrets because um, it means that like you know you faced you faced an amount of loss and and, and you, you so I've been I've been trying to like come up with what's my what's my regret um, and I think you know part of it might be that in um, in college especially I was pretty pretty heads down. And I could probably count on my hand, like the number of close friends or friends that I had at the time. And I wish I had done a better job of like speaking or, or just doing more uh, on campus. Um, Cause I know that a lot of, and, I mean, now you could like, you can go back and network and people still are good about like building alumni connections. Um, but I think it would have been more powerful to like take the time and, and not always be like doing problem sets or writing code and having everything be about like, your career, but taking the time to build some more camaraderie. <laughs> Karen, do you, do you have anything to add? Do you have a biggest regret? No, I really, I really can't think of anything. And I'm, I'm laughing because um, I, I don't know if it's Eileen, if that's how you pronounce it in the chat window, says you might be too young to have regrets. And I have a feeling I might be the oldest person in this, this whole chat room here. So thanks for that. I appreciate it. Nice compliment. I've got I've got the wrinkles <laughs> to show it. <laughs> um, what I was wondering if you guys wanted to talk at all about the process for writing the book and maybe some of the decisions that you made. I noticed it was, if I believe correctly, self-published and it is not yet on Amazon. And I think for anyone out there who's maybe thinking about writing a book one day or wants to know more about that, um, you know, how, how did you guys go about writing it, and and how why did you choose to distribute it the way that you did? Well, first off, you know, Karen and I are both engineers, so uh, software engineers. So we we wrote the book like we would, you know, build a software product, which means uh, I think it was like four to six months max uh, in terms of time from like idea to out the door uh, as a product. Um, and this one I actually did. So I wrote a book last year, and I actually wrote probably about ninety to ninety five percent of it. This time we actually. Um, changed our model a little bit where, you know, Karen wrote a lot of it, I wrote a lot of it, and Natalie, who's our editor, also um, ghost wrote a lot of it. Uh, she was pulling from our course. And so we took a lot of our scripts from our course and added material to it. And then she, of course, like massaged a lot of the copy uh, to make it flow better. And I'd say the next part of the process for us after we sort of nailed down the manuscript was the peer review process. We had about 10 people that we chose uh, who had backgrounds mostly in technology. And they actually did a really phenomenal job of giving us some harsh feedback that we needed to hear. Um, and I think without their feedback, uh, it, it, the book would have still been good, but I think it was valuable because they pointed out a couple, um, I think, like flow issues with our book. Uh, and we definitely certainly wanted to correct that. Uh, and they also pointed out like who the ideal audience was, which we had kind of from a very broad level thought, oh, well, this is just for like anybody that wants to speak. But what we quickly discovered is that this is very much um, a beginner book and it can be for an intermediate um, person who may not be engaged with the audience, but it might have like given a couple talks, but it really is for that beginner who's worried about their level of expertise, who's nervous when it comes to speaking, and is wondering how do you even like assemble a talk and then deliver it without sounding too nervous, right? Um, so I think that that was, it was key to have some of those folks in there to, to test it out. And I'll let Karen also chime in. Yeah, well, so, it was incredible and I would um, recommend this if, if it's an opportunity other people have is to write a book with someone who's already done it before. And so because Pornima had wrote had written her first book last year, she had this amazing editor already like she knew exactly who to work with. Um, and then she also had the book designer, you know, we didn't we even though it's self published. This is not a hobby. This is something we invested in and we did it in a very professional way with the um, with a great editor, a great book designer, and marketing help to get the word out. Because it is a lot of work after you write the content to then make sure the book's successful. Um, so that that's sort of my pro tip is do it with someone else who has, um, has these amazing connections or figure out how you can find the right people to help you. Because you, even though you're self-publishing, you're not doing it yourself. You can't. Um, and it's... Um, and I'm so glad we did it too. It's, it's been an incredible journey. I remember, Pornima, the day you said to me, 
and it was like halfway through our online course, we had our scripts, we were recording our lectures. And you said to me, Karen, I think we have a book here. And I'm like, really? And, and then from there, it's just been um, amazing working on it, writing it, gathering stories, forcing ourselves to uncover stories we have never even told before so that um, our readers could learn from us. So it's it's been incredible. Um, but I'll, I think your question, Alex, about, you know, we're not on Amazon yet, for example, um, is really good. And it's um, it's there's a whole phased approach to releasing this product, because um, we are approaching this as a software product would be. Pornima, do you want to answer that specific question about the phasing yeah. from your point of view? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, so like keep in mind, again, four to six months is really tight. Like most people take a year, traditional publishers take 18 months to two years mm -hmm. uh, to get the book out. And so mind you, that's like, maybe three to four months of the actual writing part, and then about two months of the peer review, the design, um, the proofreading and, and all of that. So that's um, that's pretty compressed. So in a six month time frame, this is, I, mean, I wouldn't say this is our MVP because our MVP is kind of what we put out to our peer reviewers. This is definitely like a polished you know, product, but this is our version one. And so to do that, and then to also do it on multiple platforms, that would be like saying, okay, we launched our software product on the web, and now we also are on Android and iOS and, you know, whatever else. Like, that's just, it's too much, right? So um, if, when we do a Kindle edition, we actually have to strip out a lot of the formatting. You know, we've got a number of images in there that we have to rework. Uh, so it takes time. And then same thing, we're going to be doing a um, audiobook, which should be out at the end of the month. And it takes a long time to sit there and, and read uh, like, you know, 300 plus pages uh, and do it in a way that we sound good. Um, so, you know, launching on each of these platforms just takes an amount of time. Uh, and then it also takes an amount of like marketing effort because each platform is going to attract a different group of people. So I always like to launch to my audience first because one, they're going to be uh, the kindest, you know, they're going to say nice things, they're going to upvote me on product hunt, you know, they're going to tell their friends about um, the product or the, or the book, um, they're going to write reviews on Amazon when we launch on Amazon, right? So those are, those are things to think about. Um, and they're also, I think, going to be the ones who um, will not only like evangelize, but but start to build enough buzz so that when we do launch on these other platforms, then they can tell their friends, hey, you know, it's available on Amazon, check it out. Uh, and they don't have to be like, what's Femgineer and who's Pornima and Karen, right? So I think we have to develop some level of, of popularity. Um, the second thing I will say is uh, not to like, you know, rain on Amazon or anything, but the one thing I, I don't like about Amazon is I get no customer information. Uh, I don't get an email address. All I can hope for is that somebody at the end will tweet at me that they read the book or send me an email or something like that. And so it's very hard to get initial feedback if you launch first on Amazon. So that's why I also like to launch to my own audience first so that I get some level of feedback, whether it's positive or negative. Um, and I think it's the same case with Audible too. You don't, you don't get any customer data. Um, so, so that's why we have much more of a phased approach. I would liken like Amazon and Audible to going a lot more mainstream uh, than like your, your own audience. Great. I, I, you know, I, I really like the, uh, the theme that you guys have around receiving feedback and seeking out feedback. I'm curious if you have any other thoughts that you want to elaborate on that, maybe more broadly speaking about in terms of, you know, career advice or when it comes to making a product or writing a book or really doing any kind of creative making, how important do you think feedback is? And do you have any tips or strategies that you guys use for maybe filtering feedback to know when, when do you sort of take something to heart and when do you say, oh, that's good to know. I'm just going to file it away. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to answer a slightly different question. It's related, but it's a slightly different bent on it. And I'll tell you, some of the most intimidating times have been when I have given a practice talk and to get feedback on the talk before I give it up on a big stage. And you see people that you've asked to give you feedback and they're scribbling pages and pages of notes on your talk. And you're, you start to like psych yourself out like, oh my gosh, I'm awful because look at all the notes they're taking. And in fact, when I was doing a dry run on my TEDx talk, Pornima was one of my um, people in my mini audience, my practice run, and she took like four pages of notes. And I'm, I'm, I was standing up there with my slides. I'm like, what the hell, you know, what the heck's wrong with me here? You know, like, this is just awful. Um, 
And so since then, I've um, adopted this mindset of, I'm going to assume that most of those notes are just telling me how awesome I am. Like, that's great. She did a, she nailed that. That I love that image, whatever. Um, and just get that mindset that there's going to be some good with the, um, the constructive feedback and have that, um, you know, kind of carry me forward as I'm going through it. Um, one of our peer reviewers actually, uh, in, in the, in the form mentioned this book called thanks for feedback. And, or thanks for the feedback. And I actually was like, oh, I didn't know this book existed. So I started reading it. And it's the same authors that do the uh, difficult conversations. And I really like it because it provides this awesome framework. And I think basically everybody should read this book um, because it's for the people who are taking in feedback, but certainly people who are giving it will, will learn a thing or two, but it's especially hard on the folks who are taking it, right? It's like the only thing that's hard to receive uh, in your life is, is feedback. And um, what I learned, I think like the one takeaway that everyone will um, understand is to understand whether the feedback is uh, evaluative versus coaching. And, and what I mean by that is like, a lot of times people will take it as an evaluation, like, oh, so-and-so gave me this feedback on my presentation. I must not be good enough, right? Instead of taking it as an evaluation on yourself or your self-worth, you've got to look at it as coaching. Like, oh, they're giving me some constructive uh, feedback here, what can I do to make this better? And so I like the book because it talks about all these different ways in which we um, are, you know, we want the feedback, but then we don't want it when we're having a bad day or when we have like three hours of sleep or, you know, when we're up to our, uh, you know, eyeballs in, in just like bug fixes or whatever, right? And so it's very good about kind of walking you through step-by-step step how to think about both positive and negative feedback um, in your life and kind of like Karen said, also like uh, deconstructing what what is valuable and what isn't. So in the book, we actually talk about um, some different ways, like if somebody gives you a, a, a suggestion to, to add something to your talk, well, if it's time limited, then you better ask them to take something out as well. Like what can I cut from this talk? Because um, you can't always just like add more and more and more, right? So I think it's important to kind of hold people accountable also to uh, to their feedback, like where are they coming from? And I think a lot of times people don't do that because the people who are giving us feedback might be someone who's more knowledgeable or they might be our boss or, or, or whatever. So we kind of defer to them um, and then we don't take the time to understand like the context behind why they're giving us the piece of information that they're giving us. Like if they said our presentation was bad, was it, you know, what, what where are they coming from? What were they, what were they expecting that we just didn't deliver on? Yeah, that's great. Um, I want to pull a question here from Bridget. Let's see here. So I think, whoops. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to read the question out really quick and then you guys can answer it as you see fit. Hi there, and thank you for fielding questions. Pornima, great to see you again. You're, I took your General Assembly class, uh, and it helped me focus. Um, I'm not always focused at times. Do either of you have any advice or tips for how to improve one's focus? <laughs> I, I'm definitely like a morning person, and I think for me, like especially with the writing, because you, you've got to be focused when you're writing, right? Um, for me, it's like, either 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. or 6 a.m. To, to 8 a.m. But those hours before other people wake up and can send you an email, like those are the best times to get, get the hard work done. Um, because it's also when you're not tired. Like I find it incredibly hard to make any sort of decisions, sometimes even to like make dinner uh, at the end of the day. And so I try to do the bulk of like the tough mental work at the very beginning um, when I know like the rest of the world is sleeping. But I know everyone's got like their different, it, some people are night owls and perform better then. Um, so it's kind of figuring out when, you're, um, when your group is, but certainly it is a challenge like when your phone's going off and you've got emails coming in. So I, I tried best to like turn everything off and the only thing I will have open is maybe like a Google doc to do the writing. I don't know if I have much to add to that. Minimizing distractions is huge because we are distracted constantly and there's so many um, you know, technology distractions that happen or physical distractions. So you got to know what, what is distracting to you and work to minimize that. Um, I'm also a huge to-do list person. I love having my to-do lists and just scratching things off. Um, and it's always best to identify when 
which ones are the most difficult ones to do and work on those and not just be crossing off all the easy things that are going to be sort of satisfying to get off the list, but focus, yeah, on the bigger ones to make progress on those. Okay. Uh, I, one final thing I'll say is I also like to do the harder work at the beginning of the week like the Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, um, rather than at the end of the week when I'm tired. Like I hardly do any writing on a Thursday or Friday. In fact, most of my Thursdays and Fridays are kind of filled with meetings or calls or even just like answering emails and, and things like that. Um, but I try to do like the bulk of the heavy mental stuff at the beginning of the week when I know I'm going to be like my freshest and that again, people, people might also be too busy to bug me. So it's, it's good. That's great advice. Um, there's another question here from Raja who, um, was wondering what are some of the biggest mistakes that techies make when they're uh, trying to speak publicly and maybe we can like make this constructive and talk about like pitfalls to avoid or you know, common mistakes. I'll, I'll start with this because um, I used to make the mistake I'm about to share um, so, and I made it a lot. Um, and it is having slide decks that are full of bullets of every single point I wanted to make. I felt that I needed slides as a crutch so that I wouldn't forget anything. Um, I wanted to be able to look to my slides to be able to read from them. And it was basically um, my outline, you know, in my slide deck. And what happened when I changed doing this, I, I heard from a friend, someone who used to work for me, who said he had just gone to the best presentation ever. And that best presentation ever was so good because it was all images. The slide deck only had images, no words at all. And he then, my friend tried it and he loved it too. He said it was so empowering and kind of like a weight was lifted off his shoulders, giving a talk that had slides of just images. Um, and what happens when you do this, and I've since have done it too, and I, I go more like text light. I don't go completely text free. I can't quite do that, but very text light. What happens is you're not held hostage to your slides. You can go off script and address something that you think the audience might be more interested in. Or if you're seeing a lot of people shaking their heads up and down, you can deep dive into that. Or if you're seeing confused looks, you can spend a little more time talking and elaborating on something. And you're not held hostage by using the same words on your slide, making all the points you wanted, you thought you wanted to make. And frankly, it's a lot easier to create slides that are visual. Um, you grab you know, some clip art that represents the concept you want to convey and not spend hours. I used to spend hours trying to squeeze each word into it. And it's almost like you know when you go on Twitter and you have to get your messages into 140 characters. I would spend hours trying to figure out how I was going to represent my key points in you know 10 or 12 words for, to fit in a bullet on a point uh, um, across a slide. Um, so it's something that I see techies as well as other people, but definitely us in tech, we tend to have these slide decks that are just so full of bullets and bullets and bullets of points we want to make. So I would ditch all that and, um, and try to be much more visual with slides. Use clip art, use um, photo stock kind of um, uh, photography and see how it goes. Yeah, um, I'd add a couple more things to that. So uh, a lot of times people, you know, they worry when their audiences leave or they wonder why audiences don't show up. And I think part of it is because they come up with these talks that can often be too general. You know, they'll say something like, this is the introduction to iOS programming. And it's like, okay, great. It's an intro to iOS programming, but do they need to have any level of like programming skills or is it like, you know, you know one language and we're going to teach you kind of the basics getting started in a new platform, right? So I think it's very important to take the time to identify who is that audience member, like the ideal audience, and to say like, this is for people who, you know, know some programming language and are new to Objective-C and have never written like a hello world application in iOS, like make it that crystal clear. Uh, so then you know it's a beginner audience. If it's slightly more advanced, right, then you say that as well so that people who are beginners don't come and feel overwhelmed. So with an advanced audience, you might say, you must know, you know, Objective-C and be able to like write a hello world app in uh, iOS. And if you can't do that, like don't bother showing up. And, and I think this is really important to do because 
one, you're going to get the right audience there. You're going to get people that are engaged and, and want to learn that material. And you're not going to have people who are either bored or overwhelmed because it wasn't the right level. So, so taking the time to put that in the summary or the abstract that you submit, uh, or even like, you know, as you're presenting is, I think, very, very critical. So that's one mistake I see over and over again, especially when people worry like, oh, I don't know, they're getting up to leave or I, I don't know if I gauged it correctly. And a lot of times you can talk to the organizer, like the talk organizers, the conference organizers to make sure you understand who's going to be you know, at the uh, event so that you have gauged it correctly. Um, the second thing I would say is a lot of times people do like one of two things. They either do something that's really high level. They're like, this is how I sold my company for billions of dollars. And they don't actually give you any of the steps, right? <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, that's great. Like, how am I supposed to do this? So it's really high level and inspirational, which might be great as a keynote, but maybe not as like a, you know, a, a talk to a, an audience. So I think it's really valuable to have like, Yes, a motivation for why you want to do something, but then break it down into steps. You know, break it down into how can you do one thing? Like, what's one takeaway, uh, a one action item for you? And here, I'm going to teach you how to do it, like right now, over the next five minutes. Because a lot of times when people are coming out to attend these talks, they're coming out because they want to learn something. Like, yes, they want to be inspired and entertained, but they also want to learn something. And so it's important to kind of have that balance between the two, not just like one um, or the other. Yeah, that, that's really good advice. I've, I've seen that a lot too. <laughs> um, we have another question here from Philip, and I'm going to read it. Philip says, pleasure to meet you. Awesome you're doing this. My question is, how much of a value do you think there is in the tech industry in utilizing Twitter? What has been your experience from it, from engaging with audiences to making new and lasting relationships from people you meet on Twitter? I'll, I'll go. Yeah. Do you want to? Okay, um, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I feel like I'm still a Twitter newbie. Um, I've been using it for a few years. Um, Pornima actually has mentored me on how to be successful on, an, on, on Twitter and how to grow followers and do all of that. Um, so I'm still learning. However, I have been surprised that as an independent consultant, I've actually gotten business because of Twitter followers. Um, I was shocked the first time it happened, but I got a, a, a very nice contract to do coaching within a tech company because someone there recommended me after following me on Twitter and liking the way I was approaching things. So to me personally, there's a ton of value for client acquisition. I also learn a lot. I'm on Twitter every day and it is often a source of um, insight and information for me about breaking news um, or just trending stuff that about things I care about. So I definitely get a lot of my news from Twitter um, and I can't imagine not having it as a tool. Yeah, um, so I've been on Twitter pretty pretty early on, like 2006. I mean, I have my handle as uh, as like my Twitter name, right? So um, so clearly, I was pretty early on. I didn't know how to use it in the beginning, but I got the handle because everyone was like, "You should get the handle. Just just do it." Um, so I was like, "Okay," and then I didn't really know like oh, okay, I'm going to tweet that I'm at the beach. Like, is that is this what we do? So it, it took me a little, it took me a little time to kind of figure it out. And when I started doing like FemGenior full-time, like when I started making the courses and, um, and really building up the following, one, I already had a following and I realized that a lot of them were on Twitter. Um, but two, what I really liked about it was I could put something out there and like I would get immediate just somebody somebody tell me something right they would say like yes this is great or no this sucks or um just like immediate feedback and now honestly twitter is like my crm uh i go on there and i kind of like karen i get a lot of my speaking engagements i get a lot of students into our courses we get sales of our books um i can't you know, there are so many opportunities that I get from Twitter that I don't think I get on honestly any other platform, um, even even Facebook, sometimes even my own blog. Certainly my newsletter is also pretty good about that, but I think Twitter lets me have access to people um, in a more informal way. And it's great when I can kind of start off with a lighter touch of like, hey, check out this like new excerpt for my book. And then somebody might reach out and say like, oh, but you know, does it also include this, this, and this? And then I can follow up and answer questions live uh, and in real time. 
And so that's been really valuable. Um, but then pulling them into having longer form conversations. You know, I think I sent like five DMs today asking people um, if I could interview them for the book, like readers, because I want to get a sense of like what they got out of the book, what they want to see next. Uh, and those are all things that a lot of times are very heavy to do in email or some other channels because people are much more guarded. Uh, but I feel like with Twitter, I have access to a lot of folks that I wouldn't necessarily have access to. Um, and I think part of it is also like people are always sharing, right? So if our content gets reshared a lot, um, even even this, like I think I've seen like five or 10 people who are my Twitter <laughs> followers, uh, like asking questions in, in here. So I, I think it's really, really valuable, but you certainly have to put in a level of effort when it comes to you know, following people, um, having conversations with them, uh, and using it as as a platform. Yeah. And Pornima, I'm really impressed with how you use Twitter to start that dialogue. As you're talking about, when someone writes that, um, oh, they you know they like present or they like something that you've done, a, a recent Femgineer TV episode or a blog post or something you reach right back out and say, what did you like about it? Or what did you learn from it? Or what do you wish we had covered? You know, it's something to encourage and further the dialogue. And, um, and I noticed people do get back to you. It's, um, it, it is a, it's a great way to engage with customers. So that's um, something I'm learning from you and, and trying to do more of. Yeah, I think, I think it's really valuable. And I, I remember even Ryan mentioning this uh, in the Femgineer TV episode that like one of his community building strategies is Twitter because I mean it's great to have access to so many people at once like imagine trying to do that via email that would just it would be a nightmare um, at, at that and also trying to get people's addresses um, so yeah I think it's very valuable but but I think the really the key is taking those online relationships and cultivating them offline you know I actually um, I've hired two people through Twitter because one woman reached out to me like maybe four or five years ago, I was coming to Seattle. She was like, oh, I'd love to meet up with you at the conference. I ended up hiring her. She became like my marketing person. Um, so there's been a lot of relationships that have been built. You don't have to treat it as like, oh, that, you know, Twitter is, is like for shady people. In fact, even here in, in Helsinki, one of the guys reached out and said, hey, would you like me to give you a tour of like one of our islands? And I was like, yeah, I don't know anything about um, Finland. So why not? Um, so yeah, I think it's it's really valuable as a tool. That's great. I I agree. I um I was I'm a bit of a Twitter dude myself, and I was late to the platform, but I've been I've been really impressed. And it, you know I think it's really interesting too because I don't I listened to the audiobook of founding Twitter or hatching Twitter, and uh, I think even you know Jack and Ev initially were conflicted on what what is the purpose of the platform, and in a way, it's sort of both of those things, right? It's hey I'm going to the coffee shop, and it's having a a serious conversation with people you care about. Um, before we open it up to live video guests for the last few minutes of this, and I know you have a hard stop, Karen, um, I, I want to ask one last question more broadly on what do you think some of the largest problems plaguing uh, women in tech are right now? And maybe like what do you like what needs to be done? Like what do you think should be happening that's not? What should sort of be on everyone's radar maybe that that necessarily isn't? So there's so much dialogue around this, which I'm excited about. Um, but one thing that I want to encourage anyone who's any, any tech company who wants to improve diversity is to really measure everything you do by gender and by whatever other inclusive um, metrics are important to you for um, you know, race and et cetera. Um, and what I mean by measure everything is it's not just the hiring pipeline of the candidates that are coming in and who's getting job offers. It's also things like when you have maybe quarterly or monthly team awards, like how's the gender breakdown on that? Or your patent portfolio, like who's filing patents at your company or who's going on customer visits or whatever it might be, but look at it through a lens of gender and other diversity metrics to identify are there problems with how the work is getting done at your company that is eliminating some people from the conversation. And I'm not saying that everything needs to be 50-50 because that's not what tech is right now. But if you have maybe 25% or 20% women within your company um, in engineering roles, and you're not seeing 20% of those of women getting um, 
getting awards on a quarterly basis or getting to go on high profile customer visits or going to speak at conferences or whatever that might be, then there's chances are there's some bias in place and you can kind of double click on that and identify what you could be doing to make sure that women and other underrepresented minorities have just as much a seat at the table as everybody else. Um, so I'll add something slightly different. I, I think what's interesting is, you know, when I started Femgineer, I really just started it, like it was back in 2007 when I was working on Mint and it was really a personal brand. It was like, I was a female and I was an engineer. Great, let's like put the two together because pointemobjshanker.com is just way too long, right? So, so that's what it was. And over the years, what's been astonishing is that more than 50% of my readers, you know, students, uh, followers are men. And a lot of times people are like, well, that's like weird. And I'm like, actually, it's not. And the reason it's not is because one, um, these people are brothers, fathers, uh, husbands, you know, spouses. So they're, they're supporters, right? They want to know, they want to learn how to support. And I think that's really valuable. So continuing to pull them into the conversation and having male allies is really important. And neither Karen nor I think of it as like us versus them. I think you have to have to include people. Um, and then the second, uh, which is very, very enlightening is the people who are my students and like the ones who were my very early students, like the ones where I had maybe one or two guys in a class of like 10 women, you know, I would ask them. And uh, again and again, I heard the same, the same feedback of, well, this seems like a safe place to learn where like I won't be judged. And so what that led me to believe was it, it's got to be um, something that's very deep seated and maybe the guys aren't talking about it and maybe the women are uh, a little bit more vocal, which is great, um, sort of given the way that we've been socialized. But my sense is that um, you know part of this conversation, while, while we do want to get to this, um, you know, pulling minorities up and having more women present, et cetera, is I also think that there are men who feel like they haven't gotten um, a fair chance uh, or that they feel like, you know, they, they haven't been look, uh, they've been overlooked because of their personality type. And so that's been really astonishing to me. And that's why the work that we do, we always say like, you know, yes, we want to promote women, but we're totally dude friendly um, in this. So, so I would encourage people to think in that way. It's not like an us versus them. Um, but, you know, certainly the numbers show that disproportionately, like, you know, women have not taken up a lot of positions. So, so we want to um, amplify that. Great. Yeah, I think that's a, a really great message. We have someone here who I think wants to jump in. So let's see. Uh, I think Chadley. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly. I think it's working. <laughs> there we go. Hey, hey, how are you? Good. What's your question? My question? Yeah, are you are you here to ask a question to poor Nima and Karen? No. Oh, <laughs> okay. Here. All right. <laughs> I don't know. I think sometimes you just get like inbound people just cruising through the uh, lab. <laughs> that's all right. Looking on things. There is, it looks like there's one one more question. In the queue? Yeah, Amanda. Yes. Okay, I'll read it. Uh, thanks for doing this chat. I was wondering what are uh, some of the out of the box techniques you've seen during presentations that really wowed you as a listener? You know, I actually saw this presentation, somebody on Twitter uh, who I think he came to watch my presentation uh, at the Lean Startup Conference. He sent me one of his presentations where he actually came up with a song uh for for like the entire lean startup framework and i thought that was pretty clever like a great way to kick off his presentation and engage the audience um so i thought that was yeah i thought that was pretty clever um i don't know i i probably have some more karen do you have some techniques yeah well pointy but one of our favorite from the book is um, when people choose a catchphrase and keep underlining it which means like repeating it through the talk so there's this woman beth dunn who did a talk i think last year at inbound and she her message was about basically becoming a writer and she does social media marketing for her company and she wasn't a she didn't start off being a writer but she knew she had to do it and so what she ended up doing and what her underlined catchphrase was 
write like crap, but write every day. And so she keeps repeating that. And that's so that's effective. You leave the, the you know, the, the her presentation really hearing that's the message she wants you to get across. But then she also introduced a twist where she talked about that she had a lot of weight to lose. And she knew that the best way to lose that weight would be through running and taking up jogging and doing that. But she really hated running. And so she decided that she would start running like crap, but run every day. And of course, when you start running, even if it's like crap, meaning like I can only run a quarter of a mile or a half a mile, or I look like an idiot when I'm out there because I don't have good form, it doesn't matter. As long as you start doing it, you start getting hooked. And of course, now she's lost, I think it was 75 pounds and is in great shape and so forth. So that that approach, and I'm, I'm trying to incorporate that more and more into my talks where I choose a catchphrase, and ideally it's something that is catchy and that is memorable, and I look at places that I can keep repeating it through my talk. Um, it, it's a really great technique. Great. Um, I think, let's see here. If anybody, we have just a few minutes left. If anybody who's watching wants to jump in and ask Karen or Pranima a question, we can, we can field that now. Um, but we'll just keep talking in the meantime. Um, one thing that I'm curious about, uh, Pranima, is um, you know, it seems like the pipeline of getting minority and female folks into STEM and especially computer science is not very strong. And I'm sure there are a number of problems there, but I was curious if you had any thoughts or reflections on it since um, you, you were a computer science de degree, right, Major? Yeah, I, I mean, my story is, I think, a unique one in that my dad is an engineer. And so, you know, I was introduced to it very, very early on. Um, and I think I also come from a culture like India has the most number of engineering schools, I think, in the world. In fact, they have too many engineers. It's kind of a funny problem. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I think the pipeline issue, you know, definitely starts with um, middle school and high school. I certainly in my high school calculus class, uh, it was myself and one other girl at the time, which was funny because in my eighth grade algebra class, I had a class of all girls and we all got like, you know, we aced our state test. And so it was funny for me to see like four years later, I have no peers at all. Um, so I know that there's, you know, some level of like social pressure and peer pressure, but I also think that a lot of people didn't understand the kinds of careers they could uh, get if they stayed in STEM. Right. It was always like, oh, well, I don't want to be a doctor, so I'm not going to take biology class or like, oh, I don't want to be a mathematician, so I'm not going to take math class. Like, no, I mean, that's not really how it works. There are more careers. So I think I think there was a lot of that going on. Um, but what I'm uh, hopeful about is organizations like Girls Who Code, where they're putting more emphasis at a high school level. And, you know, there's even more um, getting started at the junior high level, I think, that are solving the pipeline problem, or at least getting people in. I would say the second problem, which Karen and I have started to see a, a fair amount of change in recently is at the college level, because this is the second place where people opt in, but then towards the end of their career opt out, right? So um, I think the way that the curriculum is set up is, is very difficult. It's not the most um, welcoming, like professors. I actually had a professor once tell me that I could never be a computer architect because there were only four architects in the world. And I was like, way to crush my spirit. I mean, you could at least point me like in a different direction, right? Like, yeah, there's only four architects, but here are other career options. But instead it was like, no, like, just don't bother. So I, and I know it's not just me. Like I know there were other um, women in college with me who had gotten sort of similar advice and they all went off and become consultants um, or pursued like other other careers right so I, I think professors need to do um, more in in terms of one like having female professors I had an amazing um, female professor who I'm still really close with had she not been there I don't you know I don't know if I would have had a, a strong role model in those years um, so I think that that's that's really critical and then it, it's really having somebody at every phase so okay no worries so it's having somebody at every phase in the in the high school in college and then um mentors like we talked about so those uh, career mentors as you graduate um but i don't think you can just say like oh well we're gonna put all our attention in like middle school and let's forget high school or let's do it in college and then let's forget 
um, career. So if you're gonna you're gonna build a pipeline, like you really have to think about all the steps that it leaks at, and how are you going to get people over the hump at each of those phases. Yeah, I totally agree. It's it's an interesting and complicated problem. I hope we uh, we solve it soon. <laughs> um, yeah, and, I, and mind you, it's not like one. There's not like one band aid. It's it's definitely like you know, there's a lot of social pressure. I think as well. So while we can like continue to encourage, there's there are some social cues that have to to change over time. Yeah, I totally agree. I think Malcolm Gladwell had a really interesting point in one of his books where he talks about how like if you're not sort of encouraged um, to participate early on, it like compoundly sort of negatively affects your confidence, which affects your motivation. And then kids who are like put on the gifted track then begin to do more and aspire to do more. And it's like those differences starting in elementary school, widening out to college, just compound to a, a pretty significant effect. But we have hit our mark. And so I'd like to close up here. Um, if you have, uh, you know, if you want, if you would like people to go uh, check out the book or if you have anything that you want to plug, please, by all means, go ahead. Yeah. Let me put the link. Um, you can get the first chapter and we've got a lot of um, quick tips. So I just typed the, um, typed the URL into the chat here. Um, but yeah, check out the book. I think we've been seeing a lot of uh, like positive feedback on Twitter. People, we just like wake up in the morning and someone's like, yeah, I just finished reading the book and it was great. And now I'm getting ready to like submit a proposal to OSCon or, you know, mm -hmm. name your upcoming conference. So, you know, I would say for people out there, like set a, sm set a small goal if you're just getting started, you know, speak up in that next meeting or the next like all hands meeting. Um, or what I like to actually recommend is do a, a group session where, it, because sometimes meetings like you get, shot down or whatever, but just have a group session where you're going to say everyone's going to take like two to three minutes to present on what they have recently worked on. And that's a great, I think, icebreaker, but it also sort of shares the nervous burden um, where you're not the only one presenting, but you kind of rope people in. Um, so I would say start start there and it's a good place to start. And then um, from there, if you you know, want to submit a proposal to a talk, I think that would be fantastic. There are so many conferences and meetups going on that are hungry for people uh, and they want to have more presenters. And it's not only a great way for you to get some some visibility, but it's also a really great way for you to, to network in a way that's authentic. Like you don't have to worry about who am I meeting, et cetera. Like people are going to come up to you and ask you solid questions after you speak. Yeah, that's, I totally agree. That's awesome. And this was so great. I really enjoyed this. I think people got a lot out of this. And uh, it looks like your book is just doing amazing things. So I, I can't wait to see how it does and uh, what you and Karen are up to next. Awesome. Well, thank you for having us. Yep. Anytime. Have a great day. All right.